Welcome to lesson number four, Standing for the Truth, ready for teaching on Sabbath, April 27. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's so good to be able to open your word again today. And this week, as we study this very important lesson, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide and to bless. May your word speak to us so clearly that we understand. Lord, we thank you not just for your word, but for the way that you interact with us in our lives. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those who are in war zones and in conflict zones in the 1040 window, those who live there, those who work there away from their home countries, those who are captured, those who are persecuted, and those who are in danger. Lord, may they know your strength and your comfort during the difficult times that they face. And Lord, those experiencing financial or physical or mental or sexual abuse, we pray for them today as well. And those concerned about their loved ones, and particularly today, I'd like to play, pray for Beth and her daughter, Andrea, and Jennifer Robinson and Edith Campbell, and Sula Safoto and his extended family around the world. Lord, wherever we're listening, whether it be on one of the islands of the sea or one of the great continents, that your name may be glorified through our lives as your word makes changes in our lives. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of God be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's read that again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The modern Turkish seacoast city of Izmir, I-Z-M-I-R, was once the biblical city of Smyrna, mentioned in the book of Revelation. This ancient city of approximately 100,000 inhabitants flourished in the late 1st and 2nd centuries. It was a prosperous city, and it was fiercely loyal to Rome. Once a year, all the citizens of Smyrna were commanded to burn incense to the Roman gods. Evidently, in the 2nd century, Smyrna had a thriving Christian community as well, and many were not going to comply. Polycarp, an early church leader, was martyred in Smyrna's public square, burned at the stake for refusing to betray his lord by burning incense to the Roman gods. When asked one last time to disavow Christ, the old man replied, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I speak evil of my king who saved me? Throughout the centuries, men and women have been willing to experience martyrdom rather than give up their faith in Christ. Their sacrifice rekindles our courage. The story of their commitment to Christ renews our own commitment. This week, we will look at some biblical principles that motivated the Waldenses and later reformers such as Huss and Jerome to stay faithful to the Lord no matter what even at the threat of death from the same power that killed Polycarp, Rome, but now in the papal phase. Sunday, April 21, persecuted yet triumphant. Read Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 to 25, and Revelation 12, verses 6 and 14. What prophetic time periods are referred to in these passages? Let's begin with Daniel 7 and verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. 
He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And Revelation chapter 12 verse 6, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Whenever God's people remain faithful to him, Satan is enraged. Persecution often follows. The prophet Daniel describes a time, still future to him, when the medieval church would make war against and persecute God's people. In Daniel 7 verses 21 and 25, let's read those verses again. I was watching, it reads in verse 21, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. The prophet John described this same period as a time when God's church would be forced to flee into the wilderness, where she would be nourished for a time and times and half a time in Revelation 12 verse 14. Revelation 12 verse 6 adds, The woman, that's the church, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. God's people were nourished in the wilderness. His word strengthened and sustained them as the great controversy raged on during this long and dark period of papal domination. God's people found a place prepared for them by God. In life's greatest challenges, God always prepares a place for his faithful followers. During the time of their greatest trial, his people have found refuge in his love and care. And we see that in Psalm 46. And that has 11 verses. Let's begin at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea... Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. The 1,260 days and the time, times and half a time in Revelation 12 verses 6 and 14 are both referring to the same period. Three and a half times or years multiplied by 360 days per year equals 1,260 days. Biblical prophecy is often written in symbols. In the prophetic portions of Daniel and Revelation, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We find this day-year principle in Numbers 14 and 34, 
and Ezekiel 4, verse 6. Numbers 14, verse 34 reads, According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. And Ezekiel 4, verse 6, And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. The day-year principle rests not on these two texts only, but on a broad scriptural foundation. Dr. William Shea, chronologist and Old Testament scholar, gives 23 lines of biblical evidence throughout the Old Testament for this principle. Bible interpreters have used it throughout the centuries. The Visigoths, Vandals and Ostrogoths were tribes that believed doctrines differently than Rome's official teaching. The 1260 days began when the last of these barbarian tribes, the Ostrogoths, were driven out of Rome in AD 538. This period of spiritual darkness continued until AD 1798, when the Napoleon's general Berthier removed the Pope from Rome. Countless Christians were martyred during this long period because they obeyed the word of God. Even in death they triumphed. In Christ they were free from the guilt and the dominion of sin, overcoming through the blood of the Lamb. Christ's victory over Satan on the cross was their victory. Though they died, their death is only a rest until the return of Christ. And so to finish the day... How has fulfilled Bible prophecy strengthened your faith? Monday, April 22, Light Vanquishes the Darkness Read Jude, verses 3 and 4. What's the warning here? And how did it apply to the later Christian church? Jude 3 and here it reads, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Jude was written sometime before AD 65 to faithful Christians who were sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus, Jude 1 verse 1. These faithful believers were urged to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who turn the grace of our God into lewdness, we read in verses 3 and 4. This admonition meant even more to believers in the Middle Ages after pagan practices had flooded into the church and human traditions compromised the word of God. For many centuries, people such as the Waldenses stood as champions for the truths of Scripture. They believed that Christ was their only mediator and the Bible their sole source of authority. We read in the Great Controversy, page 61, In every age there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life and hallowed the true Sabbath. End of quote. Read Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. What promise does God give those who are faithful to him in the face of death? itself. Revelation 2 verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. These words were written to the church at Smyrna, 
One of the city's patron gods was Dionysius, the god of festivity and fertility. When the priests of Dionysius died, a crown was placed on their heads in their funeral procession. John contrasts this earthly crown placed on the head at death with the crown of life placed on the heads of those who are victorious over the forces of evil. The crown of life is presented to those who endured trials, difficulties, suffering and death itself for Christ's sake. The crown of life inspires those faithful believers to endure death itself for Christ's sake. The crown of life always motivates believers in challenging circumstances. It inspired the Waldenses through pain and persecution. They knew they would see Jesus one day and live with him forever. The crown of life also speaks to us. We may go through trials now, but a crown of life awaits us as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so to finish today, what encourages you in challenging times? What frightens you? What promises can you claim for those times? Tuesday, April 23, Courage to Stand Compare Acts 5, verses 28 to 32, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 12, and Revelation 3, verse 11. What basic principle is found in these texts? Acts 5, beginning at verse 28. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, and he said, Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestor raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as Prince and Saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And Revelation 3 verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. One of the distinguishing characteristics of the Waldenses and each one of the Reformers was their absolute allegiance to God, their obedience to the authority of Scripture and their commitment to the supremacy of Christ, not the papacy. Their minds were saturated with New Testament stories of faith and courage. With Peter and the Apostles, they could say, we ought to obey God rather than men in Acts 5.29. They grasp Paul's admonition in Ephesians 6.10, Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. They took seriously Jesus' counsel, Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown in Revelation 3 verse 11. Rather than submit to the traditions of the Roman Church, these stalwart men and women of faith had the courage to stand for the truths of God's Word. The Waldenses were one of the first groups to obtain the Bible in their own language. A moving account of their hand-copying of the Bible written by Jean Leger, a Waldensian Bible copyist, contains first-hand information of their work, including drawings. The Waldenses secretly copied the scriptures in their mountain communities of northern Italy and southern France. Youth, at an early age, were instructed by their parents to memorise large portions of scripture. Teams of Bible copyists worked together to laboriously copy the Bible. Many of these Waldense young adults travelled throughout Europe as merchants, quietly sharing the truths of Scripture. 
Some enrolled in universities and, as the opportunity arose, shared the portions of the scriptures with their fellow students. Guided by the Holy Spirit, at the right moment when they sensed a receptivity on the part of some honest seeker, select portions of their precious scripture passages were given away. Many paid for their fidelity and devotion with their lives. Although the Waldenses did not understand every Bible teaching clearly, they preserved the truth of God's word for centuries by sharing it with others. Proverbs 4.18 reads, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Solomon compares the path by which God leads his children to a sun that rises higher and higher. If God simply threw a cosmic switch and the sun shone instantly in all its brightness, it would blind us. After darkness engulfed the world for centuries, God raised up men and women committed to his word who continued to search for more. And so to finish today, how can we, reflecting the light of Christ, shine in our own community? Do we? Wednesday, April 24, The Morning Star of the Reformation Read Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, Psalm 119, verse 140, Psalm 119, verse 162, and Jeremiah 15, verse 16. What similar attitudes did David and Jeremiah have toward the word of God that were really the cornerstone of the Reformation. First of all, Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great Reward and Psalm 119, verse 140. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. And Psalm 119, verse 162. I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. And Jeremiah 15, and verse 16. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Each of the Reformers rejoiced in God's word. They delighted in doing God's will. They loved his law. One of the most significant foundational truths of the Reformation was the joy that studying the scriptures brought. Bible study was not a laborious task, it was not a legalistic exercise, it was not a rigid requirement, but a delight. As they studied the Scriptures, they were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We read in The Great Controversy, page 94, the character of Wycliffe is a testimony to the educating, transforming power of the Holy Scriptures. It was the Bible that made him what he was. The effort to grasp the great truths of revelation imparts freshness and vigour to all the faculties. It expands the mind, sharpens the perceptions, and ripens the judgment. The study of the Bible will ennoble every thought, feeling, and aspiration as no other study can. It gives stability of purpose, patience, courage, and fortitude. It refines the character and sanctifies the soul. An earnest, reverent study of the Scriptures, bringing the mind of the student in direct contact with the infinite mind, would give to the world men of stronger and more active intellect, as well as of nobler principle, than has ever resulted from the ablest training that human philosophy affords. End of quote. 
Read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. What counsel did the Apostle Paul give to Timothy regarding sharing the word of God? 2 Timothy 2, beginning at verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others, joining with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. The truth of God's word and the joy of salvation in Christ so filled the hearts of the reformers that they had to share it. John Wycliffe spent his time translating the word of God into English for two reasons alone. The living Christ changed him through the word and the love of Christ motivated him to share what he had learned with others. Before Wycliffe, Very little of the Bible existed in English. Though he died before Rome got to him, the papacy, undeterred, dug up his remains, burned them and threw his ashes into a river. But just as those ashes were dispersed by the water, so God's word, the water of life, spread far and wide as a result of his work. Thus, God used Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation. Thursday, April 25, Cheered by Hope. Read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. How did believers in the Middle Ages experience the reality of the great controversy? Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. What was it that cheered the faithful Waldenses during the horrible persecutions they faced? What gave Huss and Jerome, Tyndale, Latimer and the martyrs of the Middle Ages courage to face the flames and the sword? Faith in the promises of God. They believed Christ's promise, because I live, you will live also. John 14 verse 19 They found his strength sufficient for life's greatest trials. They even found joy through fellowship with Christ in his sufferings, and their faithfulness was a powerful witness to the world. They looked beyond what was to what will be. They knew that, through the resurrection of Christ, death was a defeated foe. For these courageous men and women, the strangled hold of death was broken. They clung to the promises of God's word and came away victorious. Read John 5, 24, John 11, 25 and 26, 1 John 5, 11 to 13. What assurances do these promises give you personally? How do they help us in the trials of life? First of all, John 5 and verse 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And John 11 verses 25 to 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And 1 John 5, 11 to 13. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John Huss would not falter in the face of imprisonment, injustice and death itself. He languished in prison for months. The cold, damp conditions brought on a fever that nearly ended his life. Nevertheless, the grace of God sustained him. 
During the weeks of suffering that passed before his final sentence, heaven's peace filled his soul. I write this letter, he said to a friend, in my prison and with my fettered hand, expecting my sentence of death tomorrow. This is from Bonachase, volume 2, page 67, quoted in The Great Controversy. We continue, when, with the assistance of Jesus Christ, we shall again meet in the delicious peace of the future life, you will learn how merciful God has shown himself toward me, how effectually he has supported me in the midst of my temptations and trials. In the gloom of his dungeon, he foresaw the triumph of the true faith. The Apostle Paul's admonition speaks to us with increasing relevance today. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, Hebrews 10.23. As the promises of God sustained his people in ages past, so they sustain us today. And so to finish today, what might it mean to lose everything for Christ? What in the end do you really lose? See Mark chapter 8 verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? What lessons can we learn from the Waldenses and Reformers that can sustain us in earth's final conflict? Friday, April 26, Further Thought From The Great Controversy, page 103, we read, God permitted great light to shine upon the minds of those chosen men, revealing to them many of the errors of Rome, but they did not receive all the light that was to be given to the world. Through these, his servants, God was leading the people out of darkness of Romanism. But there were many and great obstacles for them to meet, and he led them on step by step as they could bear it. They were not prepared to receive all the light at once. Like the full glory of the noontide sun to those who have long dwelt in darkness, it would, if presented, have caused them to turn away. Therefore, he revealed it to the leaders little by little as it could be received by the people. From century to century, other faithful workers were to follow, to lead the people on still further in the path of reform. And then, on pages 105 and 106, in another letter to a priest who had become a disciple of the gospel, Huss spoke with deep humility of his own errors, accusing himself of having felt pleasure in wearing rich apparel and of having wasted hours in frivolous occupations. He then added these touching admonitions, May the glory of God and the salvation of souls occupy thy mind, and not the possession of benefices and estates. Beware of adorning thy house more than thy soul, and above all, give thy care to the spiritual edifice. Be pious and humble with the poor, and consume not thy substance in feasting. Shouldst thou not amend thy life and refrain from superfluities, I fear that thou wilt be severely chastened as I am myself. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. What is progressive light? Why does God reveal truth gradually? How do these principles apply to God's church today? 2. How do new discoveries of truth relate to previous truths that God's people have understood? Why must new light never contradict old light? 3. No matter where you live, your culture is going to promote values, ideas and moral codes that in some way conflict with what the Bible teaches. After identifying these areas of conflict, how do you see yourself and us as a church dealing with these challenges? How do we remain good citizens while at the same time not succumbing to whatever warped values our culture proclaims? And four, how does John Huss's letter impact your thinking today?
What impresses you about this letter? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Tale of Two Neighbours by Andrew McChesney Musa's religion taught that it was wrong to raise pigs for sale, but Musa worked as a pig farmer. Niklanaga's religion taught that it is wrong to divorce for any reason except sexual immorality, but Niklanaga married three times and on top of that had three common-law wives at different times. The two men who were neighbours lived lives that were far from their professed religious beliefs. But God had a plan for them in Mozambique. One day, one of Musa's pigs entered Nicolagua's vegetable garden and caused considerable damage. Nicolagua was furious and demanded a fist fight. He won the brawl, and Musa limped away, bloodied and battered. But Musa did not intend to give up. He vowed revenge through witchcraft. You have 30 days to prepare for your death, he told Nicolagla. The next day, Nicolagna woke up seriously ill. He spoke about Musa's threat to his friends from the Seventh-day Adventist church, where he had once worshipped. As Nicolagla's condition steadily deteriorated, he grew worried. After 15 days, he asked church members to pray for him, and the pastor organised a prayer team to visit his house. But Nicolagla did not get better. Another week passed and his options seemed few. With the clock ticking down on Musa's 30-day deadline, the pastor called for a night of fasting and prayer for Nicolagna. Early the next morning, Musa knocked on the door of the pastor's house. He told a fantastic story about his gods had fought with Nicolagla's god and Nicolagla's god had won. He said he could no longer take Nicolagla's life. He wanted to become a Christian. I want to worship Nicolagla's god, he said. Nicolagna recovered from his illness and both he and Musa joined an Adventist baptismal class. Both gave their hearts to Jesus in baptism. Today, both are powerful forces for good in their region of Mozambique. God is powerful and he answers the prayers of those who seek him in faith, said Nelson. Aquinesi, the pastor. After all, he said, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That verse is found in Hebrews 11 verse 6 in the New King James Version. Thank you for your Sabbath school mission offerings that help spread the gospel in Mozambique and around the world.